Good morning. I consented to the uh, YouTube video so long as they focused on the slides. Um, as I noticed, many people were an hour of a, a particular individual under the uh, lights of the camera. So thank you so much for coming out, braving the icy roads, and uh, joining me to talk about something that I feel very passionately about. Um, I've been looking at this area of, um, of uh, pediatrics, so pain management for children, particularly in the emergency department, for a number of years, probably about five years now. And um, or it became apparent over the last couple of years that codeine was becoming our new Demerol. And, uh, for, and with good reason, as I'll discuss. But this question kept popping up into my head. And when, uh, when uh, Dr. Garshanka was kind enough to give me an opportunity to present, I thought, what better title than if not codeine, then what? So codeine is perhaps not the best choice, but then what do we use instead? I wasn't sure that we had a clear answer. So just in, term, in way of disclosures, um, I have no financial investment in the material. I don't have any stocks in any of the drug companies that are, uh, for the drugs that are being represented. And uh, my research is mainly funded through the CIHR, through the Drug Safety Effectiveness Network. Um, the learning goals, I understand you cannot have more than three because once you hit three, you stop listening. So I'm giving you three. Okay, understand current controversies in pain medications. Um, introduce the role of pharmacogenomics in pain therapy. This is not a genomics lecture. I can't sit through those and I study genomics. Um, review current literature for acute pain management, which I thought was bringing it back to the clinical perspective. A lot of us come here with a clinical background and we want to know how does all of this translate into the patient in front of me. So that's what we'll end on because I think that's uh, the most clinically relevant piece. So um, this is eye clicker time because I, I think it wakes up people. So um, which statement best describes your current oxycodone practice, uh, prescription practices for pediatric patients? Are you A, it's my preferred opioid for children, B, I rarely use it, or C, I have never used it? And I'll let Lisa guide you with that. So if you can go ahead and enter your answers, we'll give you about five seconds and then we'll see what your answers look like. I see most hands are down, Lisa, so maybe we can see what answer you guys have. Little suspense, little drum roll. There we go. So most people are saying I have, 60% are saying I have never used oxycodone. Okay, let's keep that information in our brain. We'll go on to the next slide now. Which statement be oh, pardon me. Which statement best describes your current coding prescription practices for pediatric patients? Same three options. Be interested to poll the room. And I think most people have entered their answers. So half of our audience says, I rarely use it. 40% roughly says, I've never used it, and 11% it's your preferred choice. That's interesting, that's about, the 11 to 20 percent is about keeping with uh, what we've discovered from national surveys as well. Okay, and we'll move on to the next slide. Third, what statement best describes your current oral morphine prescription practices? Same three choices. Oral morphine, not IV. And most people seem to have successfully clicked. So half of you say it's your preferred opioid for children. That's fascinating. Um, and 20% say you rarely use it. 30% have never used it. So an interesting mix there. So it seems that our center is, um, at least if this audience is representative, is uh, moving towards some more oral morphine use. Okay. All right, so that ends the eye clicker part. You can put down the toys and we'll move on. <laughs> All right, so oxy what? I started, my first slide was oxy, was how much oxycodone are you using? There are a lot of formulations of, of oxycodone. There's oxycontin, which received a lot of press and has since been pulled off the market. It's been replaced with oxyneo. This is a long-acting oxycodone product meant mainly for people with chronic pain, oncology pain, oncology-related pain. Um, there's oxycodone, which is uh, often marketed, and those of you who have been in the emergency department and seen us use it, it's called Percocet here in Canada, Roxacet in the U.S. Percodan is just another formulation with, with, in which they mix the oxycodone with uh, aspirin. I mention it to you because patients may use these names, and uh, they, don't, they don't always use generic names, so it's good to know we're all talking about the same drug. So... Not my words, I put them in quotation marks. Oxycontin um, be became known as hillbilly heroin. 
Um, I think it's a little bit derogatory, but I put it out there because that's how it has been reported in the press. Um, OxyContin marketing was blamed for addiction epidemic. This is CBC News in March. Um, and uh, what happened is this drug um, is a moderate to potent um, narcotic or opioid drug. It was used for people with, with musculoskeletal chronic pains, low back pain, etc. So the people who are more likely to, to um, receive those injuries were not those of us who were waxing philosophical about the next CIHR grant in our office, but those who were working harder labor right, physical labor. So this was a drug that was prescribed heavily in places where there were um, automobile plants, mines, etc. And so um, people started using it for chronic pain and then the addiction became an issue. Okay, so that's where that concept of hillbilly heroin came. Why heroin? Because as I'll talk to you briefly, you can actually take this drug and turn it into an intravenous form through something called cold water extraction. I got a very big education on YouTube um, the last couple of weeks. Um, so <laughs> people are crushing these pills and, and very, very crude, basically crushing these pills in water, taking the distillate out, filtering it through like a coffee filter and injecting it. Okay, so that's how it was being used. Interestingly, I re listened to a few videos of um, people who use both heroin and oxycodone, and they felt that it was a comparable um, effect, um, which is kind of scary, right? Um, the only thing is, is they said you had to use a lot more oxycodone than equivalent. I don't know if that's dollar value or gram value of heroin. I'm not, I didn't, didn't go into that much um, background research in that, in that realm. But um, that's why OxyContin was so interesting, because you can ima imagine that a sustained release product has a lot more drug in it than an immediate release. So you get a lot more bang for your buck, as it were, if you're using a continuous release product. OxyNeo was created in response to the problems with OxyContin. OxyNeo is not crushable. So that's how they got around the problem with people using it for uh, injectable drug abuse. So just in case you thought we were safe from this, this is from this year as well. Uh, Winnipeg physician was not only prescribing or uh, making available OxyContin to his patients, he was doing it in exchange for sex. So um, OxyContin received a lot, a lot, a lot of press um, because of the various things that happened around it. So what did this lead to? In 2007, the U.S. filed a class action suit. $635 million in Virginia were actually given out um, to the, to the um, people who filed the, the uh, suit. And uh, just briefly cut out a little piece there. They said OxyContin makers falsely claimed that it was less addictive, less subject to abuse, and less likely to cause withdrawal symptoms when no such claims were supported by the U.S. F uh, Food and Drug Administration. Okay, so that's why they were successful in winning the suit. Now, Canadians have followed. Um, in April 2012, a Canadian class action suit was, um, was uh, filed against Purdue Pharma, who, makes oxy who made OxyContin in Canada. Um, the results have not yet been decided. So we're not immune to this. This is not an American phenomenon. So there's really mixed perceptions. I mean, some people picture OxyContin or oxycodone, like that gentleman on the left injecting it. And some people picture it on the shelf next to azithromycin as a legitimate um, opioid choice in the absence of other clear uh, options. So, um, you know, there, there's a real problem with the way we're perceiving these drugs. But, so that's oxycodone. We don't have a lot of clinical experience, judging by our eye, eye clicker, but it's coming. I think this is a drug we can't ignore, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. But what about therapeutic misadventures with a drug we know really well? Um, codeine. There's been a lot of, is, um, you know, is there anyone in the room who hasn't heard about codeine misadventures in the last five years? It's been in the lay press, it's been in the medical press, it's a fairly, uh, fairly prominent issue right now. So I want to contextualize it for you because it's a Canadian story. This is not a story of some distant, horrible, you know, thing that happened uh, far away. This is a story of Tariq and Ronnie Jameson. That's a 30, she was at the time a 36-year-old accountant who lived in Toronto, and this was her firstborn uh, son, and he was born by spontaneous vaginal delivery after a lovely pregnancy, and she was breastfeeding him as, you know, she had been told she, uh, was a good idea, and she did. And uh, Rani, the mom, was prescribed Tylenol number threes, or Tylenol plus uh, acetaminophen plus codeine, for episiotomy pain, because she'd received an episiotomy during her delivery. And um, on day seven, she noticed her baby was very lethargic. Okay. On day 11, she saw her pediatrician because he wasn't feeding well, but the baby had mostly recovered his birth weight, so you know, she was reassured and sent home. Um, to contextualize this, um, Ronnie was taking two T3s twice a day. 
that's a very, very reasonable dose that, you know, we would say you could take them every two T3s every four to six hours back in the day when we used it a lot. She was taking four pills a day. And in fact, on day seven, when her baby was lethargic, she was also feeling really, um, feeling a lot of the adverse effects of, of uh, narcotic. And so she actually reduced her dose to one pill twice a day. Okay, so she was not abusing this drug. She was taking two pills. On day 13, Tarek died in his kitchen as paramedics tried to revive him. Um, Post-mortem, Tarek had seven times the acceptable morphine concentration in his blood. This is the baby, not the mother. Uh, Rani was phenotyped as an ultra-rapid metabolizer of the drug. Okay, really tragic story, very tragic story. This is what began our concerns with codeine in Canada. So this is our story. So this became, every, this was everywhere, National Med Review of Medicine, um, CBC News, um, everyone was concerned. So the, in, back in 2007, after Rani and Tariq's story, uh, we were very concerned about codeine being used for breastfeeding mothers. And said, what are we doing? And what's really interesting is, again, Canadian literature on uh, postpartum pain, CMAJ published, ibuprofen was outperforming codeine. So why were we still prescribing codeine? We knew this at the time that this baby died, that literature was available, a huge Canadian study, and yet we were still prescribing T3s. Um, moving on to um, other settings now, all of a sudden we started seeing case reports of children who were dying after tonsillectomies. They were getting codeine for throat pain and a, a series of cases, three, four cases of children dying after codeine use for, for tonsillectomies. So the US FDA in August just very recently put out a warning saying if your child has obstructive sleep apnea and is having tonsil, tonsillectomy adenoidectomy, you uh, should probably be avoiding codeine drugs codeine-containing um, uh, drugs. And then um, back to, you know, the, the, the popular uh, media as well picked up on this very concerned about, about, um, about uh, this use as well. No, not to be left behind, the medical literature, this is where it came from. This is perhaps probably the most tragic case of all in, in my perception. This was a case of just under two-year-old twins in Europe who were given codeine for a cough and um, they're maybe 18, 20 months old. One of them uh, went into cardiac arrest, was taken into the hospital and died. And when these parents went home, um, the second one was in um, respiratory, ex respiratory distress extremis, was brought in, was successfully resuscitated but had had, um, had hypoxic um, uh, brain injury to some degree but was sent home successfully in quotation marks, whatever that means. So um, for, for a viral upper respiratory tract infection, they lost one of their children and potentially have um, anoxic brain injury with the second. So t for some reason, that one really struck a chord for me. Um, so Canadian Family Physician, Mother Risk, a great organization out of uh, Toronto, um, is now uh, advocating against the use of codeine during breastfeeding. And um, these were the three case reports I just mentioned, if anyone is interested. This group, uh, Gideon Koren, the senior author on this paper, his group has led the gen pharmacogenomics research for coding um, throughout the world. But this is the original article. Again, uh, kind of a sad read as you read these three case reports of otherwise healthy children who die using um, a drug that was being given with good intentions. Somebody did not want these children to be in pain. But uh, we have to think about it. So in 2010, this, all of this led, actually even two years before the, the uh, tonsillectomy cases, um, the editors at uh, CMAJ put out uh, an editorial, has the time come to phase out codeine. In 2010, the Hospital for Sick Kids removed codeine from their formulary. You cannot get it if you want it, so, which is a big step. They're making a very big statement there. That's the, what we did with Demerol a few decades ago, right? Um, they, in fact, myself and my colleague Amy Drendel, we responded to this editorial as well, encouraging people to think long and hard about why they would choose this drug given the options that we have now. So we've ta I've talked about codeine. I want to contextualize it for you with the pharmacogenomics. So I use the word, um, uh, I use the word um, ultra rapid metabolizer. People talk about slow metabolizers. We talk about genomics. What is this? Because I found it very confusing and I only studied it because Terry Clausen told me I had to. Um, so that's how, I start, that's how I stumbled into it. Um, so analyzing uh, pharmacogenomics. This is a basic primer promise, six slides maximum, okay? Analyzing entire genomes across groups of individuals to identify the genetic factors that influence our response to drugs. So in research, we often study populo population pharmacogenomics. So I'm doing a study right now on the eMERGE. We're collecting DNA from 300 children getting either ibuprofen or oxycodone. And then we're going to analyze that and describe 
how the Edmonton population, what their genetic uh, sort of um, uh, genomic breakdown is so we can have some guidance about what the better drugs to prescribe for them would be. Now when I take that, those data and link them to individual patients, I'm no longer studying pharmacogenomics but I'm now studying pharmacogenetics. So pharmacogenetics is the study of an individual's genetic makeup in order to predict their response to drug and guide prescription. So what you do for your patients is pharmacogenetics if you're taking that into account. In clinical practice, we apply pharmacogenetics. It's a form of personalized medicine. I think if you just look at that picture, it's, for me, that crystallized it. You have a group of people who have the same diagnosis and the same prescription, but they all respond in different ways. That's pharmacogenetics. That's it. I won't say any more about that. So what is the genome? The Human Genome Project, you remember a few years back, was a huge deal. It identified three billion letters. I'm a simple person. I call them letters. Fancy people would call them nucleotides that make up the human genome. This project produced an average sequence, the average human being, but each of us differed just slightly, about 0.4%. That's it. Between me and that blonde lady in the front row is 0.4%. That's it. That determines how we look. That determines personality traits. That determines how we metabolize the drugs, which is what I'm talking about in this, uh, in this context. Interestingly, uh, we in chimpanzees, 96%. Um, I'm an optimist, so I like to think that means there's a tenfold difference between me and chimpanzees versus me and Christine. But uh, you can look at it however you want. <laughs> All right, so what about these variations in genes? If we change a single letter, that's a single nucleotide polymorphism. A single letter change is a SNP. Sometimes you hear people who talk about genetics talk about SNPs. It's changing one letter in the book of life. Okay, so C, G, T, A, one of those, one letter in, the book, of, in, our, in our book of life. But if you, uh, if you have changes that affect entire blocks of DNA, like a deletion or a, or a duplication, that's changing a page in the book of life. Okay, so you can think about it that way. That's it. Those are the only two kinds of variations that I understand. So pharmacogenomics of codeine is subject to those two kinds of changes, okay? Codeine is converted by, the, by liver enzymes to morphine, and then morphine binds to those wonderful mu receptors and all those things we have in our body that make us feel better uh, when we take a pain medication. Uh, binding of this morphine provides the pain relief, as I said. And there's several different forms of the enzyme that exist, and that's why we uh, metabolize codeine differently, all of us. The metabolism of codeine uses cytochrome P450. It's a group of enzymes that are responsible for hepatic drug metabolism. Okay, we, I think we've prob most of us have probably heard of cytochrome P450, but there's lots of subgroups of cytochrome P450, and the one that's really hot for codeine is 2D6. So CYP2D6. And these differences between me and John and Christine and Neelam are that we have differences in those SNPs. Remember the single letters. That's it. Those single letters change and all of a sudden we metabolize codeine differently. If I have low enzyme activity, I will get inadequate pain relief. If I have high enzyme activity, I will get good pain relief, but I'll be far more subject to the toxicity as well. Simplifying it a bit, but it gives you an idea of where it's at. So what is the clinical relevance of this? Who cares, Samina? You can go to your lab, study it, whatever. But no, what matters is that close to 12% of the Caucasian population is unable to metabolize codeine to morphine. Okay, that's a big chunk, and those numbers go even higher for other um, ethnic uh, groups. Um, approximately half of North American Caucasian population has at least one reduced functioning allele. So half of the Caucasian people in this room will suboptimally use codeine if they were prescribed that drug. That's a big number. Um, the reason I keep presenting Caucasian statistics is that is what is most highly studied um, in the world. So that's what um, you can find the most information about. But if you look at that table below, um, we're now flipping it over from low uh, people who can use it um, suboptimally to people who are ultra rapid metabolizers, people who have extreme effect and then like uh, Ronnie Jameson can actually end up becoming toxic themselves or passing it on to their infant. So in the African Ethiopian population, 29% are ultra rapid metabolizers. Um, African American, uh, lower, 3 to 6%. These are different studies. And you can see that the, the uh, numbers change. The point is, is that people um, d uh, react to codeine very differently and very dramatically. You know, 1% all the way up to 29% is ultra-rapid metabolizers should make us stop and think about what we're, how we're prescribing. And in our incredible melting pot of a world, do we re are we really able to identify people's ethnic backgrounds that clearly anymore? So I advise you to use a great deal of caution 
uh, when prescribing these drugs because my son, whose name is Sean Graham, will have uh, Southeast Asian <laughs> genomics for codeine metabolism, but his name may not tell you that. So what should we use? Okay, I promised you I'd tell you about the controversies, and we've done that. Codeine controversies, oxycodone controversies. I told you that I talked to you very briefly about genomics, because I can't handle more than six slides. So we've been through that. So now what do we do clinically? I imagine a lot of people are here because they wanted to know um, or had some interest in knowing what, what, what this means clinically. So I'm going to use an exemplar of a condition to study, and I've chosen musculoskeletal trauma. So this is the prototype of a healthy child with acute pain. This could also be a post-operative pa uh, patient who's just had an appendectomy or, um, or has just had general anesthesia for some abscesses, as we know MRSA is, is uh, rampant now, giving these terrible abscesses to children, um, things like that. So just to, uh, I've chosen the exemplar of musculoskeletal trauma because that's what I study and I know best. But um, there's no reason to think that this information doesn't apply to other healthy children. I would caution you to apply this to children with chronic pain. I would caution you about applying this to children with complex medical conditions because they have been grossly understudied in this um, context. All right, so first I'm going to present you, to you a systematic review that I've done with some of my colleagues that's currently under review uh, for publication, but I have permission from the uh, principal uh, investigator to present the results, uh, Dr. Lim Sylvie LeMay in, uh, in Montreal. So the objective was to determine the most efficient treatment for pain management of children presenting to the emergency department with a musculoskeletal trauma. We looked at 27 studies. We ended up including only five, which is always sad when you do a, a review how many are excluded. Um, but we ended up with almost 600 children that we looked at. And I will briefly walk you through these. If you haven't seen these forest plots before, or as my colleague Dr. Brian Lowe likes, Rowe likes to call them blobograms, um, I will walk you through it. So basically, um, the first one is comparing codeine to ibuprofen. So this is pooling all the studies we have. In this case, it was one study um, comparing codeine to ibuprofen. If the blobs or the triangles and, and squares are on the side that favors ibuprofen, that means ibuprofen came out stronger. Had they been on the codeine side, that would imply that codeine came out stronger. If they're sitting right on the line, that means the drugs are probably clinically equivalent. If your drug is on, say, in this case, as it is favoring ibuprofen but touches the line, that means that the data is not entirely robust. Treat it with a little bit of, of caution, and usually that's because the total number of patients included is smaller. So in this case, it's clear the evidence is weighted towards ibuprofen based on the results of this systematic review, but you can see it just touches the line, meaning we probably need a little bit more uh, information to, uh, to prove this point for musculoskeletal trauma. The second uh, forest plot is comparing acetaminophen to ibuprofen and again is favoring ibuprofen over acetaminophen for acute musculoskeletal trauma. This top, for what I've labeled figure three, is ibuprofen versus acetaminophen codeine uh, combination, and it's sitting right on the line. So what that says to me is that ibuprofen is equivalent to acetaminophen plus codeine for pain treatment. So what does that mean? Should I, should I be using T3s then? Well, no, because I know, and I'll come to this later, that there are a lot of side effects when you use codeine. So if two drugs are equivalent, would you not choose the one that gave your patients less side effects? So in my opinion, and I'll give you some information to back that up, I would choose ibuprofen over T3s. And then lastly is acetaminophen over codeine, basically the same. That one is a, I don't know, that one resonates with me. Acetaminophen and this narcotic that we thought was supposed to be so much better than acetaminophen are coming out the same. Kind of interesting. Uh, with the caveat that these are smaller numbers, but very interesting that this is how it's emerging. So then my colleague, Dr. Amy Drendel in Wisconsin, the only other peds emerge doc in the world who cares about pharmacogenomics, um, she, she published this trial in 2009. And um, she looked at ibuprofen versus acetaminophen with codeine uh, for acute fracture pain. And she was looking at unreduced fractures. So the ones that we cast and send home, we don't manipulate. They're generally should be less painful than the ones that we have to manipulate. And she looked at them in the at-home setting. This was the first study to really do that in a randomized control trial. And I thought that was really important because when we see children in the emergency department, I see them for two, three, four, maximum six hours, and then they go home. And we put all this effort into figuring out what the best drug in the ED is. But that's a blip in time. They spend the next six weeks healing at home with these parents figuring out what to do, or their caregivers figuring out what to do for their pain. So we need to be moving our studies into the home environment, and that's why my current studies are all studying at-home use of drugs as well, because I agree with Amy in that matter. 
So her primary outcome was failure of a signed study medication leading to the use of rescue medication. So she randomized them to either go home on ibuprofen or, or acetaminophen plus codeine. But she said, you know, if you have pain, here's a rescue drug. It was just the opposite drug. So ibuprofen people got T3s and T3 people got ibuprofen. If you can't manage your pain with the drug I gave you, it would be unethical for me to bar you from using anything else. So use your rescue drug. And then she measured how many people use the rescue drug. She recruited 336 patients for this study. And this was her fellowship residency research. I'm amazed. Um, she then uh, counted the treatment failures. And treatment failures for ibuprofen were 20%. And those using acetaminophen with codeine were 31%. So that would mean ibuprofen users needed a rescue drug 20% of the time and acetaminophen with codeine users needed it 31% of the time. Um, unfortunately, as it fell out, these, the um, difference of 10.7% was not statistically significant. You can see it just missed statistical significance, but that is how it was reported. She, wrote, uh, she, uses, she used the uh, FACES pain scale, which is the Wong Baker, the six FACES, and then people tell you which face correlates with their pain. And she noticed that for ibuprofen, the median pain reduction was two FACES, whereas acetaminophen was 1.5. Um, again, no statistically significant difference. So you say, okay, so 350-odd children took acetaminophen plus codeine or ibuprofen, and their pain was essentially treated the same. So it comes down to that same question, what are the side effect profiles? So now our research um, is really starting to focus on the adverse events, adverse effects, side effects profile of these drugs. Um, interestingly, when she looked at functional outcomes, what do kids do? They play, they eat, they sleep, and they go to school. So she measured those four things. Children, um, there was a lower proportion of children using ibuprofen who had play and eating affected. So children on ibuprofen played better and ate better than children who got acetaminophen with codeine. Intuitively makes sense because we know from personal or clinical experience that codeine will give children GI upset, constipation, and also makes them somnolent. So of course they're going to drop their eating and their sleeping, right? So this was our adverse effects table. Uh, I will spare you reading out every number, but the point, I, I draw your attention to the first line, any effect. Uh, people had um, s some adverse or side effect in half of the patients receiving acetaminophen with codeine, whereas 29.5% with ibuprofen, okay? Um, remembering as well that with placebo, sometimes you get as high as, you know, in the 20s as well, just because using a medication has um, side effects. So why should we use any opioid for, moder for any moderate pain, right? I've done such a great job of convincing you today how great ibuprofen is. I'm telling you it's better than acetaminophen. I'm telling you it's better than codeine. So why should we ever use any opioids? Should we just be prescribing ibuprofen? Well... In, it, um, in uh, the Clark trial, which was uh, the senior author was Amy Plint in, in Ottawa at CHEO, um, she looked at these kids and she was very, very forward thinking. This was published in Pediatrics, I think, in 2007. Very forward thinking. She said the WHO, World Health Organization, defines acceptable levels of pain as under three on 10 or under 30 millimeters. So I'm going to look at all these kids and not just say, oh, this drug outperformed that drug. This, this study, by the way, was in that systematic review I presented to you. I bring it to your attention because if you look at those circled numbers, she looked at how many kids actually reached that WHO standard of adequate pain management in the ED. 40% of, uh, of children under codeine reached it at 60 minutes, which is our marker. We, most studies look at one hour, which means 60% of children receiving codeine were inadequately treated. Almost uh, same number for acetaminophen, and still, even still, almost half of the children receiving ibuprofen were inadequately treated. This is why we still have to think about another drug. Okay, almost half to 60% of children are inadequately treated with monotherapy with ibuprofen or these are those other drugs. So Clark's conclusions were, although ibuprofen was more efficacious uh, in providing analgesia, only 52% could be defined as receiving adequate analgesia as defined by the WHO. And although codeine and, acet plus acet codeine and acetaminophen, because they studied them separately, resulted in some pain relief, the actual level of change was just within clinically significant range. So those of you who study pain know the minimally clinically important difference is around somewhere between 11 to 20 millimeters. In other words, if, if I have a 7 millimeter change in pain, I probably can't perceive that, but if I have a 15 millimeter change, then I feel a little bit better or worse, depending on which direction it went in. So the codeine and acetaminophen changes weren't even perceivable. They, they were measured because you have a large number of patients, so you can get a statistic, but it didn't actually, wasn't clinically relevant on an individual level. Although ibuprofen provided better pain relief than the other two drugs, it seemed that ibuprofen alone was not adequate. Okay. 
So this is why we need it. If that doesn't convi um, sorry, entirely convince you, um, in Amy Drendel's study, as many as 30% of children fail treatment if they were prescribed a single analgesic. Remember, I presented that to you just a few slides ago. And of the children who used the rescue medication, 92% had at least one face on the Wong-Baker scale reduction in pain after using um, the uh, alternative medication. Actually, I need to apologize. It's not. It's the faces pain scale revised that was used, not the Wong Baker scale. I apologize. Um, probably no one cares, but I feel wrong for saying the wrong name of the scale. <laughs> okay, so faces pain scale revised. Um, um, uh, so again, 92% felt that rescue medication made them feel better. Okay. So what is the emerging evidence in this field? What can we do? So I've told you the problems. I've told you why we need to add more. Now let me tell you about the new evidence that's emerging. So this is um, a, uh, a table that I lifted from a review paper that I did with uh, Amy Drendel and some other colleagues. And, and uh, Geneva Kircher is an emergency resident here, so I got to work with her as well. And we looked at all the studies we could find looking at um, analgesic ef efficacy within the emergency department for musculoskeletal trauma. And you can see the drugs they're studying. The usual suspects are there, acetaminophen, ibuprofen, and codeine. But oxycodone, oxycodone, oxycodone kept showing up um, as the only other medication that was being studied, and this is a, likely a reflection of the way um, American practice happens. So we've done a, a North American survey of um, fracture management amongst pediatric emergency doctors and orthopedic surgeons, and uh, it's clear that in the U.S., um, at codeine is still their number one prescribed narcotic, or was in 2010, 2011 when we did the study, but also um, the second most commonly used drug that's starting to equal codeine was oxycodone, and talking to my American colleagues as codeine is getting, a very, uh, getting this reputation of, as a drug we shouldn't be using, oxycodone use is increasing. What that means is that there's more of it to study and more of it to look at. So oral morphine is an interesting phenomenon. It's, it's emerged as a favored medication in Eastern Canada. So two or three years back, when we were still trying to phase out codeine and starting to perhaps introduce oxycodone in Western Canada, the sick kids, CHEO, um, they switched off of uh, codeine and started using oral morphine. And it's beginning to be used more frequently in inpatient medicine at the Stollery, and that is evidenced by our eye clicker survey at the beginning as well. Um, but there's limited and conflicting evidence for this acute pain in children. I emailed sick kids uh, pharmacy and CHEO's pharmacy and said, thank you for removing codeine, thank you for introducing oral morphine, can you please send me your evidence for this? And boy, you want to see some circuitous emails. <laughs> no, they could not give me a single article. So it made some intuitive sense. IV morphine works, oral morphine, pure, narc pure opioid makes some sense, but they could not provide a single article that supported it. So I went looking myself, because we've actually got a, um, a grant into CIHR right now to do a randomized control trial for oral morphine, because we recognize that it's being used, and we need to get some evidence, because it's lacking, horribly lacking. We want to do a multi-center trial. We'll see if they agree that it's important. But um, the bottom line is, um, I could find only very small trials. There's a few burn trials for burn dressing changes and such, but really not much else for acute pain. I found two trials, or no, I, not, I shouldn't say trials, two studies done by the same person, um, this uh, Christelle Willedon in Paris. This was a study where they actually used oral morphine plus or minus midazolam for fracture reductions, which makes me kind of cringe on the inside because it's such a big deal here. We use intravenous procedural sedation all the time, but um, they were doing it with oral. And um, they studied it to look at um, what the results were. Very small number of patients, about 60 patients. And um, the, whether or not they added midazolam was their study question, but it was resulting in about a minus 27 to minus 35 millimeter pain reduction. So that's fine if your pain was at 6, but what if your pain was at 8 or 9, which is what I expect it was when they come in with an acutely angulated arm. So I'm not sure that they were, um, they were, they were achieving adequate analgesia. Unfortunately, the way this study was reported, um, I couldn't pull out all that information. This was the same person, uh, another article she did looking at oral morphine use as well, and was reporting about uh, 50 millimeter or 36% change in pain, which again is great if your pain was at 5 or 6. If you drop at 36%, you might be reaching those WHO standards of adequate analgesia. But if these kids had a higher pain, they wouldn't be. So what about this one? This is getting a bit of um, traction now. I've got colleagues at the Grey Nuns uh, texting me and saying, do you have any articles on this? We want to bring it into our eMERGE. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, so uh, from our systematic review, we looked at 
couple of studies, you can look at the size of them. They're quite small, right? 60 patients, 70 patients, but it's really compelling. This is either putting uh, fentanyl into an uh, into a nebulizer like you would Ventolin in the old days before we switched to metered dose inhalers and just having them nebula nebulize and inhale it, or um, using that little atomizer you see there, you just stick it on the end of any old needle and spraying it into their nose. This is so compelling to me in the emergency department because when that child comes in with that acutely deformed arm and they're screaming, you don't even have to get an IV and you can spray this in their nose at triage and then put them in the room because it seems so unfortunate to me. Every minute a child spends in pain after they have contacted a healthcare provider is, is, is uh, unacceptable to me on some level because we have the tools and technology to fix it. So this is very compelling. I think we need another trial. So if we don't get the oral morphine money, this is the next proposal I'm going to write because <laughs> it would be the same patient population. I have to sort of spread it out a bit. So when you look at this, um, these two studies, the albeit small, compared fentanyl intranasally or nebulized to IV morphine, and it's favoring fentanyl. Hey, that's kind of neat. Um, it's sitting on the line, but again, if this require, morphine requires an IV and fentanyl requires a mask or a spray in the nose, and as a parent, I would probably opt for the spray, you know? It seems like the kinder way to go. And the timing is incredible because you can do that right away. You don't need to get an IV. So with all that information um, in your heads, and I hope I kept it somewhat limited because I don't like to overwhelm people, um, the, what are the current evidence-based recommendations? So I will try to present those to you now with the caveat that this is my interpretation of the, of the uh, literature. So I would say if someone has mild pain, somewhere between 1 to 3 on 10, and they're uncomfortable because for some people, one, you know, one on ten, two on ten, not a problem. I chronically live with two on ten just because I'm old. Um, so for me, I don't medicate myself all the time. But if someone was, had an acute injury that resulted in two or three on ten pain, I would say take ibuprofen, ten milligrams per kilogram, every six hours as needed. I am amazed how many parents think they can give ibuprofen every four hours, how many of them are giving it every three hours. So it's become a standard in my practice now when I, when I talk to parents about pain or fever management to review and write down those parameters for them because they get, mis they get it mixed up with acetaminophen. If it's moderate pain, again, four or five uh, on 10, probably ibuprofen may be adequate for many people. Not everyone, because we all, pain is such a personal experience, right? But for some, it may be adequate. If it's not adequate, my second line now is to add acetaminophen at 15 milligrams per kilogram. I'll tell them if it's really bad at the beginning, we know from uh, some of Amy Drendel's work that the first 72 hours after a fracture is the most extreme uh, amount of pain. And by day six, day seven, they're really managing generally without, anal uh, without um, oral analgesia anymore. So if they're, I'll tell them take both at the same time if it's really bad. If it's not so bad, start with ibuprofen. An hour later, if you're not getting the desired result, add your acetaminophen on top of that. So that's my first line for the moderate pain. But if you're getting up into the six, seven, on 10 pains where they've had uh, manipulation of the limb done. And that hurts because the injury hurt and then we manipulated it. So yeah, it's gonna hurt even more for the next few days because we've caused all kinds of swelling, inflammation and injury by manipulating it. For those children now, we have two choices. I'm using, I'm either prescribing oxycodone or I'm prescribing oral morphine. Those are the two choices. Personally, I'm I put oral oxycodone on that list first because there's more evidence in the literature for me to draw upon. Um, until I see more um, clear evidence, uh, trial-based evidence for oral morphine, I'm still a little bit um, hesitant um, to, to uh, venture there. Um, what about if they're at severe pain? Then you can always still include ibuprofen for the anti-inflammatory and, anti, um, uh, and analgesic effect, but I'm using the same two drugs, oxycodone and oral morphine, at higher um, potency or higher uh, dosing. So 0.2 for codeine, oxycodone, I beg your pardon, instead of 0.1, and on the 0.5 side for oral morphine. So that I just put up there um, as a sheet that we have in the emergency department. I, I created that for my department just because uh, my group was saying, well, fine, Samina, you've been going on about codeine for years now. We'll stop using it. But what the heck do you want us to use? And I named these two drugs and said, great, can you tell us how to prescribe them? Because we're not using it yet. So it's just a little cheat sheet I made in collaboration with, my, with our emergency department pharmacist, um, which is posted in the emergency department. And if anybody has any interest at all in having it, please take it and and use it and spread it around if you find it useful, <laughs> okay? So I can get that to you if you wish to have it. Um, so I will finish with uh, the, the words from the wise Dalai Lama, 
and would like to open up the floor to questions. I didn't want to present too much as I suspect this may um, cause some debate or questions. So I wanted to leave ample time for you guys to provide your experience and input. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, Absolutely. Um, hello there. Um, just speaking to the uh, sites um, who are uh, joining us remotely. Um, do any of them have questions that they'd like to step forward with? Um, and while we're waiting, Dr. Kirikides? Thank you, Samina. That was a fabulous talk. Thank you. <clears throat> um, what I'd like to ask you is where does the 10 milligrams per kilogram for ibuprofen come from? Because I suspect if 15 milligrams per kilogram was safe, it would have a much bigger effect. I know when I have toothache that if I take two ibuprofen as prescribed, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. If I take four ibuprofen, the toothache goes away. So I'm wondering if we're actually underdosing our children. Mm -hmm. with 10 milligrams per kilogram. Has there been any work looking at pushing that Absolutely. So, um, Dr. thank you, Dr. Kirikides. Um, Dr. Kirikides has pointed out that uh, we're dosing our children with ibuprofen at a maximum of 10 milligrams per kilogram, and she is wondering if there's any research or evidence to support um, increasing that dose to perhaps 15 per kilo, um, and thereby potentially optimizing the effects of ibuprofen analgesia. Um, to date, my understanding is that 10 milligrams per kilogram, in fact, the range is 5 to 10 milligrams per kilogram as recommended by the manufacturer. I only ever present 10 milligrams per kilogram because I feel that the five milligrams per kilogram is suboptimally treating um, their pain or their um, fever, depending on what you're using it for. Um, so the 10 comes from the, uh, the upper limit of the manufacturer recommended dose. Um, I suspect there's been some hesitancy to go higher because of the GI related complications that we've seen in the adult population. Interestingly, the pediatric population seems to have a uh, protective phenomenon going on. They do not get the GI side effects, um, the GI bleeds and, and hemorrhages uh, or hemorrhages that the adult population do. They're relatively protected. So that's where it is. I have not seen studies that have pushed the children's pediatric limit above 10 per kilo ever for ibuprofen, but that is a question to take back to my colleagues that do a little bit more of the basic pharma and who would do the, the, uh, the blood test to check the, kin you know, the kinetics and stuff of it. They seem to throw yeah. opioids around quite freely. Right. Everybody's afraid to push the ibuprofen. Right. And I suspect that we have gains to be made if we were brave enough to do that study. Right. So Dr. Kirikides is wondering if we were brave enough to do that study, would that then give us a chance to optimize our ibuprofen use before introducing opioids? It's a compelling uh, uh, concept. And I'm going to think about that one, Dr. Kirikides, because I haven't given much attention to that before. Thank you. Um, John. John? Do we have? Sorry, did Sorry. I? Did I say John? Sorry. Mark? Well, <laughs> Mark, <laughs> Dr. Bellatrudy, so please. <laughs> I'm looking for a John. She was pointing at you. <laughs> please go ahead. Go ahead, Mark. Mark yeah. Bellatrudy, sorry. Um, thank you for the presentation. It was uh, very interesting. Um, one of the big issues that I've seen in the time that I've been going to is change of positions, which is always, uh, always a challenge. And I, I was interested in your own work in that because certainly we've made that change. Tylenol and, and ibuprofen are not options when you're neutropenic. Uh, Asking if these are dangerous, as well as our sickle patients, where all those two drugs are first line. What we traditionally went to was codeine, and we've now successfully switched them all to a morphine that helps to represent your department with their intractable pain. Um, right. We've actually uh, studied and that's in preparation the actual change process in our oncology department because we were heavy users. And it wasn't as bad as people perceived. Sure. So thank you, Dr. Bellatrudy. Dr. Bellatrudy is a pediatric oncologist here and was mentioning that within his practice and his group's practice, they have made a transition from using, they continue to use acetaminophen and ibuprofen as first line for their sickle cell patients. However, that's not an option for their oncology patients because of the risk of masking febrile neutropenia. And then on top of that, they've transitioned from codeine 
to um, oral morphine for their first line uh, oral opioid. And Dr. Bellatrudi was commenting on the studying the transition of physician changes to practice of medicine. Um, I'm not an expert in that field, but I do know that um, I think as a group, and I, I, this will be more of an editorial, I think physicians are resistant to change. Uh, we like the way we do things, and it is sometimes a struggle to introduce change. Um, I'm very glad to hear that things transitioned uh, relatively well for your department, but I would argue that on oncologic departments uh, are probably at the cutting edge of appreciating pain management, right? That is such an integral part of your practice. Um, we have certainly, I think we're in a watershed zone right now, uh, Mark, from the point of view of transitioning, at least in ambulatory or urgent, uh, emergent care, where we recognize that codeine is not a great choice and we've <coughs> decreased its use. Unfortunately, what has really been agitating me, frankly, for the last year is I haven't seen a, con a concurrent increase in the use of oxycodone and oral morphine. So my fear is that people are saying, oh, well, acetaminophen and ibuprofen is so great, off you go with that, but we're not giving them a safety net prescription for what happens if that isn't enough. Um, and that's my worry is, so I think I'm ho very optimistic that this is just a watershed zone where we haven't quite got enough evidence for the other drugs to, and, and there hasn't been enough time for people to get comfortable with that practice, but it is coming. The process itself is fascinating, um, and I'm not a, I'm not one who studies that, but it is really interesting to get, when people, when physicians buy in, change happens overnight, but getting them to the point of buying in is difficult, and some of my colleagues do study um, translation of evidence into practice, and there's generally a decade of, of lag, minimal, before we see the change fully accepted. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Hartfield. <laughs> oh! Everybody's getting their names on. It's not just me, thank you. I should have just stuck with Dawn and not been, not been so formal. Dr. Davies, please. <laughs> so, um, recognizing I don't treat mm. acute pain, just a, a few things um, to discuss. One thing is, if we consider the massive number of prescriptions for codeine that have been written over time, as tragic as they are, like all drugs are poison, right? And we will have adverse events from everything. So the things that concern me in that CMAJ or the next one, um, a rural physician talked about throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And it just gets to your point of people will undertreat pain and we'll be back in the 80s where kids are only given um, simple analgesics. Um, I think a lot of physicians are not comfortable and not educated in how to dose morphine and oxycodone, et cetera. Um, the other thing that concerns me is about the WHO recommendation that for opioid naive patients you can dose up to 0.5 milligrams per kilo per dose. I don't think that's safe in an unmonitored yeah. setting. Yeah. Um, so I think we just need to be careful. The, uh, the last point is that as a syrup, which most small children are taking, codeine is always 5 milligrams per mil. For morphine, it's 1, 5, 10 milligrams per mil. And I'm worried about the, the patient that calls the doctor on call three days later that doesn't know the kid and doesn't even know the formulation, mom can't find it on the bottle. So I think um, if we do a massive shift over without adequate education and time, we will see lots of damage related to using potent opioids right. um, as well. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Davies. Um, <laughs> so first point that uh, Dr. Davies made was uh, regarding um, her experience in the, in the chronic uh, pain world and um, her concerns um, regarding um, the use of narcotics in, in, um, in an acute setting, people translating that over to the acute setting and not being cognizant of the upper limits of the dosing for these drugs. So I think that was actually her third point, but I'll start with that. And I agree that 0.5 milligrams per kilogram is a for oral morphine is a very scary number, and there's no cap to oral morphine. You can keep going. So I'm not sure I'm comfortable doing that without ever having tested it in the hospital setting. So I agree with you. We tend to dose on the lower side until we're sure how they will respond to it. Um, so that is definitely, um, definitely a concern, um, and it will take time to change practices for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Quick. Yes, go ahead, please. Miralax or the PEG 3350. 
Have you looked at Tramaset? Because I know there's kind of this move over here in part to go with the Tramaset piece and kind of branching both areas. Can you give us any suggestions? Sure. Um, thank you for that question um, from, from Lynn, uh, Dr. Sonnenberg. Um, there, it is interesting, um, the tramacet, uh, tramacet as a drug does show up, so that's a combination, uh, synthetic opioid plus uh, acetaminophen, um, is used in the adult literature and some post-op surgical literature, but it hasn't really translated over into acute care for um, acute musculoskeletal pain uh, for children. Um, we don't have a lot of experience with it as yet, um, and I'll be, I'll be blunt, I, I have not studied it or looked at it in great detail because of the paucity of pediatric studies to know what the side effect profile is compared to codeine or oxycodone. But uh, you're right, we're searching for um, other options over codeine at this point, and I think people are using what they're comfortable with. My, if I had to hazard a guess, I would guess your surgical colleagues have used it with adult patients, and they have experience there, so they're drawing over from that experience experience over to pediatrics. As to my knowledge, there's not very much pediatric literature on, tra on uh, Tramacet um, uh, to date. That's right. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Schultz. Yeah. Uh, Nina, that was a fantastic uh, presentation. Thank you. Clear <coughs> and very informative. The opiates, I'm a pharmacologist. The opiates are a fantastic drug that nature has given us in a sense and are very effective pain relievers. They always appear a double-edged sword and Because they should be gotten out of that house. Right. Because kids are looking on the internet, and they and they have this perception that a drug in a bottle is sort of fun and safe. Somebody's figured it out, put it in a bottle, and yeah, you get this high and a buzz, and they'll find this out on the internet really quickly, and they'll try that out. And a lot of uh, teenage uh, addictions have started at that level from stuff that is just in medicine cabinets. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Schultz. Ma uh, makes a very good point about um, how um, oral opi or opioids are nature's gift to our pain management, and that is wonderful that we have those, but we always have to temper that with our concerns for um, opioid uh, abuse, um, particularly when we're prescribing it to children who may be um, at risk themselves or have siblings or family members at home who may potentially abuse the drug. Um, it's a great point that you make. I think all opioids have a, uh, an abuse potential. The OxyContin or, or OxyNeo, which were those con continuous release pr um, preparations, um, I would never prescribe from the emergency department as a pediatric emergency physician. If I ever needed to do it, it may be in the case where one of Dr. Bellatrudy's patients have come in and it would be in consultation with, with uh, his, him or his colleagues. So from a, from a personal point of view, I don't worry too much about the uh, abuse potential for the continuous preparations because I don't prescribe them, though I fully appreciate that there's those of, there are many in the audience who do have to temper that. However, there's always abuse potential for acute acting opioids as well. So anytime I give them a prescription, just putting it on a triplicate pad itself is a very big deal. So when you sit down with the parents and explain, this is a special prescription, you need to give this to the pharmacy, this is an, an, you know, an oral opioid, it's, it needs to be treated with respect. So I have a little spiel that I give them. I don't just tell the nurses six pack of Percocet to go because you can write an order like that. I don't do that because I want to have the conversation with them. I don't, I'll be honest, I don't say, you know, do you have any teenagers? Uh, you know, I don't trust teenagers, you know, I won't go there. <laughs> but uh, I will say, like all opioids, this has abuse potential and also uh, toxicity potential for younger siblings. So always in a locked cabinet, always out of reach, dispensed by a parent. This is not a drug to give the child to dispense to themselves at school when they have pain. Um, so we give it, and I'm also fairly 
careful about choosing the number of pills I dispense. This is not something I write as 60 pills or <coughs> 90 pills, and I'm amazed um, having um, had personal experience within our family with people having musculoskeletal pain that required stronger medications in the last six months, how op freely um, our, my, my healthcare professional colleagues will write very large prescriptions for, uh, for oral opioids and how I'm left with this pantry full of narcotics in my house to dispose of. So thank you for that point. It's well taken and we should all keep in mind that when we're prescribing these, you don't want to be a fear monger. You don't want people to start saying, no, I won't use it. But do keep it in mind that this is a concern. Interestingly, most parents will look at me and say, ooh, you want to give me morphine? Ooh, you want to give me oxycodone? So they already know you're not telling them something they don't know. In fact, you can just inform them a little bit more about, about it. Yeah. Thank you. We have a question regarding prostaglandin anaphylaxis with uh, use of uh, presumably ibuprofen um, and, and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Um, I'll be honest, I've not come across a case report in pediatrics in my readings, um, but it's not an area I have expertise in. Um, the, uh, I have looked at systematic reviews of adverse events and, uh, and side effects of acetaminophen versus uh, uh, paracetamol or acetaminophen. There's a huge systematic review that was published a couple of years ago and showed there was no difference between the two drugs in terms of likelihood of GI side effects and um, asthma, which is another hot topic, um, as well as, um, as uh, toxic effects. So I can't speak specifically, I'm sorry, to the prostaglandin-related uh, um, anaphylaxis, but I've not come across any case reports in my reading. I don't know if anyone else, perhaps Dr. Schultz might have some insight, but no, I haven't seen it either, no. no. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm going to have to close this down. Sorry, it's 9.30 already. Uh, but I'm sure Dr. Ali will be around for anyone to talk to and have discussions. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you so much for an excellent talk. Thank you for having me.